Atamaria, everybody, and uh, good morning. Um, welcome to the last of our weeds um, biocontrol webinar sessions that we're, we're giving this week and in our biosecurity bonanza this year. Um, Angela Bounds is going to give our talk this morning. Angela is a recent um, uh, addition to our weeds team here in, in New Zealand. Um, she's based at Lincoln with us and her um, specific skill base is around aquatic weeds and biological control of aquatic weeds. Angela's come from South Africa and has worked with a number of our South African colleagues who also work on the biocontrol of weeds. So um, Angela's going to talk to us about um, an update on some of our biocontrol agents and what they've been up to in the last decade or so. So take it away Angela. Okay. Thanks very much, Hugh, for that introduction. Um, after that, I'm sure a few of you are wondering why I'm talking about um, a decade of weed biocontrol in New Zealand when I've only been part of the team for a fairly short while. Um, and there were a couple of things that motivated my um, my idea or yeah, why I decided to give this presentation. And um, I think the first thing was that with an outside perspective, I've been very impressed by the number of agents um, that have been released in New Zealand. And I actually looked at the stats and out of the 67 weed biocontrol agents that have been released in New Zealand since 1929, just over a quarter of them uh, were released between 2010 and um, 2019. Uh, so that's, that's uh, pretty good going. And uh, the other reason um, that I was that I was quite excited about uh, about what's been happening is because I'm the point of contact uh, for the public uh, for our weed biocontrol programs, and I also work quite closely with the biosecurity officers and uh, all the different regional councils through the National Biocontrol Collective Program. So I often get first-hand information on what's been happening in the field and any exciting new developments, or members of the public um, send. Con, uh, an email contact or an email um, inquiry um, to ask about uh, what the agents are doing and where can they get them because they've observed extensive damage in the field. So, um, and then also this was an opportunity for me to to learn a bit more about the programs that um, that have have sort of well were all um, developing when before I arrived. Um, so it's going to seem like I'm whizzing through a whole lot of information, and I basically am. So, but the point of this talk was really just to give an overview of what's been, um, what's what's happened in weed biocontrol during this decade in New Zealand, and um, just to highlight some of the successes and and some of the recent developments, particularly. Um, whoop. Okay, so starting with Willy Nightshade, I'm not going to spend too much time about talking about in, each individual weed. Is native to South America and it's a major forestry pest and also a threat to uh, biodiversity in New Zealand. <laughs> oh, that's not working. I have to use my mouse. Sorry about that. Um, so only one uh, to date, only one agent has been uh, released for Willy Nightshade in New Zealand. That's the Willy Nightshade lace bug which was released in 2010. It's a sap sucking bug and both the adults and the nymphs uh, Suck, pierce the leaves uh, with their mouth parts and um, suck the, the the sap out of the out of the leaves, and this causes leaf chlorosis, which is this kind of yellowing um, of the leaves, which uh, severely inhibits the photosynthetic capacity of plants. They have a very short uh, generation time, so they can build up numbers really quickly, and they tend to have population outbreaks. So they potential to have potential to have a significant impact in a very short period of time. Um, so the, the lace bag has established pretty well in New Zealand throughout the distribution range of Willy Nightshade. And um, this is just an example um, in the Bay of Plenty um, where the lace bag has done significant damage to Willy Nightshade. It does prefer, uh, well it, it only really does well in shaded areas. Um, and what we're seeing is that the, the lace bug builds up really high population densities toward, towards the end of summer or early autumn, um, damages the plants severely, uh, they drop their leaves, and um, although the plants regrow the following spring, they're not as robust, um, they're under severe stress, and uh, some of their branches have died. Um, and so 
you know, over time we're starting to see them having with this repeat pattern of, of a population outbreak and severe damage and, and regrowth of the plant, um, they're having a, a significant impact in certain parts of regions of the country. Um, another example, this is a very um, successful site uh, where the Willy Nightshade Laceberg has done really well. This is in the Waikato. Um, this repeated defoliation or damage to the leaves of the plants is, causes severe stress. And um, the landowners of the site, who's also a biosecurity officer, has been very impressed by the Laceberg damage here. And it's um, had, causing a significant reduction in Willy Nightshade in, at this site. And then, whoops, sorry. Um, and then this is another site um, in Northland where the damage by the laceberg has been extensive. Uh, this my, uh, site has been monitored to, since 2016 and although the larger plants have not um, been killed, some of the smaller ones have. And I believe that none of the plants have flowered since 2016. Uh, so that's having a mass massive impact on, on the plants, obviously not, not able to set seed. But again, um, because this lace bug def definitely does prefer shaded areas, it's a little bit limited in its impact. So we are looking at additional agents uh, for any night shade currently. So second weed is Traders cantia fluminensis, also native to South America. This was a major conservation concern for New Zealand because it prevents um, regeneration of, of our native forest plants. Um, four agents have been released for Traders Cantia to date. Um, these, these three very similar looking beetles uh, were released between 2011 and 2013 and they were given the very endearing and apt nicknames of Nobly, Shiny and Stripey. I'm sure you can um, guess who's who in the zoo there. Um, so the, these, um, the top one here, which is, is Nobly, is the trad stem beetle. The adults feed on the leaves and two distinctive elongated windows on the upper surface of the leaf. But the larvae are the managing, damaging life stage, um, which um, mine this, uh, the stems. Then the trad uh, leaf beetle released in 2012. The adults feed on the edges of the leaves, also causing very distinctive uh, damage. And the larvae scrape the epidermis of the leaves, mostly on the underside. And then the third beetle was the tip beetle, which was released in 2013. The adults can sometimes consume whole leaves, um, but again, it's the, the, damage of the, uh, the, the damage of the larvae that is most significant. They um, feed on the tips, which, which um, prevents further growth, the stem tips. Um, so the, the damage of these three agents is, was expected to be complementary. Uh, and um, they've established pretty well throughout the distribution range of New Zealand. Not all three beetles that are, are at all three sites, but uh, they, they are, have established pretty well. And then the fourth agent um, is the yellow leaf spot fungus, which is was only released in 2018 and is already established at at least five uh, regions in New Zealand, most recently in Stewart Island, uh, where and apparently the spread um, down there has already been very impressive. So. This is um, one of the biocontrol success stories in a short period of time. So um, this is uh, Nobly, the stem beetle, just some examples of where, the, where it's had quite significant field impacts. This is in the Bay of Plenty. At the time of release, the trad infestation was pretty bad. And three years later, um, bare ground was um, visible and you can see a significant reduction in the infestations there. At the bottom here, we have before and after. Um, this is in the Waikato, uh, four years after the release of the stem beetle. Again, uh, significant impacts are visible. And this is just the, the damage that you can see that the stem beetle causes um, the larvae mine the stems, um, causing, them, causing them to collapse. And the adults do quite a bit of feeding damage to the leaves. Then this is Shiny. This is, I believe Shiny's doing really well in the Bay of Plenty and I think as well uh, in Waikato, but these two before and after photos are both from Auckland. This was a, a quantitative study done by uh, colleagues um, up in the North Island. This was in 2011 and the after photos are in 2018 at two different sites and you can see a severe reduction um, in, the, in the ground cover and um, regeneration of some native plants at those sites is great. Um, the tip beetle is a little bit of a question mark um, at this stage. It definitely has established um, 
but uh, and it was in fact predicted to be the most damaging of the three beetles, I think, um, because it does so well in the in the lab. Uh, it did establish pretty well at a site in Northland, um, but that was unfortunately destroyed by flooding and they haven't recovered. Uh, so we don't really know what's happening with the tip beetle. My colleague Quentin Painter that's been working on them thinks that they perhaps are more vulnerable to predation than the other two beetles because Nobly is really good at hiding. Shiny is very active and they fly as soon as they're disturbed, whereas, um, whereas Stripey tends to sit on uh, the leaves of the plants and doesn't really move. Um, possibly it's warning coloration, mimicking something in, in South America in the native range. So they kind of left un, untouched in, over there, but um, predators in New Zealand perhaps don't know this um, petition mimicry. And then the yellow spot leaf fungus, as I said, has been extremely successful at some sites in a very short period of time. This is at uh, the Wangaro Valley in, in Waikato. Uh, the, the fungus was released there in 2018 and just one year later, you can see this top right photo in the bottom too, a severe reduction in, in the trad at these sites and these are little Kahikatea um, seedlings emerging and um, everyone was, was really impressed with the early results. The only thing is about the trad fungus is that it, it definitely will only do well in cool and damp sites, uh, preferably um, year round, so it's unlikely to establish throughout the establish throughout the distribution range of trad, but certainly looks like where it does establish well, it will be very damaging. Then Japanese honeysuckle, native to Japan, it's a climber, so it's uh, obviously smothers vegetation in the canopy and on the ground. There's quite a wide distribution in New Zealand, and to date, um, two agents have been released, both in 2016. I'm sure many of you recognize the Honshu White Admiral as a fly, it's a firm favourite um, of everyone's because it's quite a beauty. Um, so the larvae are the damaging life stage. Obviously, the, the adults don't feed on the plant, and the larvae can be very damaging, completely defoliating plants. Um, to date, we only know of one site where uh, the butterfly is definitely established. That's in the Karangahaki Gorge. And although no visible damage to, to plants has been found yet, uh, the, the butterflies are regularly seen and have dispersed uh, about 50, meter, 50, uh, 50 kilometers from the original release site. So they seem to be doing really well there. They potentially also have established on Waiheke Island as um, adults were observed they had obviously overwintered after a, re a large release of larvae, so, um, but adults have not been observed since. So the butterflies have also been released at several sites over several successive years all over the country, and uh, at this stage, establishment uh, is unconfirmed at many of these, at all the rest of the sites, but they could potentially be persisting in low numbers. Uh, but um, we also do know that the larvae are particularly vulnerable to predation, as are all free-living caterpillars. Uh, our colleagues in, in the North Island uh, did a study where they excluded flying and crawling uh, predators, and uh, the survival of the larvae, uh, uh, the caterpillars, increased by 23-fold. So they definitely are vulnerable to predation, and initially high numbers of larvae, larvae were being released by the biosecurity officers in the different regions where Japanese honeysuckle is a problem. So this last season we decided to uh, change uh, rare, or release strategy and instead of releasing caterpillars, pupae were uh, uh, released into the field in the hope that the butterflies would emerge and mate and, and spread and lay eggs, which would hopefully increase their chances of establishment rather than putting uh, a, a nice little bunch of food out for, for predators to all munch on in one place. So we'll watch that space and see. Hopefully um, we'll start having a little bit more success. Uh, then the second the second agent that was released uh, um, was the Japanese honeysuckle, Japanese honeysuckle stem beetle. Only two releases to date in one part of the country and establishment is also unconfirmed, but the, the individuals that were released first were reared on an artificial diet, so they potentially were not the fittest individuals, uh, but rearing strategies have been uh, revised and they're now able to rear the beetles on, on whole plants in the lab, which is obviously much better. And next season, we're hoping to at least release 100 to 200 adults, and um, which may increase chances of establishment and 
once establishment, it's likely to be a pretty good agent. Then Lantana camara, uh, so another horrible weed leading to permanent habitat loss, can lead to permanent habitat loss where it invades. Uh, two rust fungi have been released both in 2015. And the Lantana blister rust able, is able to infect um, the leaves, the petioles, and the stems of the plant, whereas the, the, leaf, the Lantana leaf rust only affects the leaves. Infects the leaves. Uh, to date, we don't know of any, uh, it, well, it seems like the Lantana blister rust has failed to establish, whereas the leaf rust is established in, in Northland um, pretty well. And it can have uh, lead to up to 50% defoliation of bushes. Uh, and although, again, the plants uh, recover in spring, apparently um, seed set and the number of, or the number of fruits and the size of the fruits has been reduced um, on infected plants. So Darwin's barberry, a native to Chile and Argentina, and replaces shrubland and regenerating forest in New Zealand. And this little cutie is the Darwin's barberry seed weevil, released in 2015. The adults damage the plants by making holes in the leaves and puncture the fruits. And the larvae, um, again, are the damaging life stage, though, where they feed inside the, the fruits, severely reducing the number of viable seeds. And that's been released at a couple of places um, throughout New Zealand, and establishment is not yet confirmed. Uh, some feeding damage, I think, was observed in Southland, uh, but I'm not sure if there have been any follow-ups. But sorry, something I actually meant to say at the beginning of this talk is that the information that we have is only, um, you know, from feedback that we get from bio, bio, uh, the biosecurity officers and um, and I naturalist, and of course, when our researchers have an opportunity, but they, to get out into the field, but there might be there might be things that we don't know that you know. Um, so if you know anything about the agents, and please do get in contact and let us know. Feel free to send photographs, and we're always willing to or want to hear about what our agents are doing in the field and in different parts of the country where we can't always always get to. Uh, Chinese privet, a major problem in the North Island. Only one agent has been released. To date, uh, the privet lace bug, which, uh, like the woolly nightshade, uh, a lace bug is is a sapsucker. Both the nymphs and the adults cause this leaf chlorosis um, again, and uh, which reduces the photosynthetic ability of the plant. Uh, the bugs have been released uh, at multiple locations, and their ha establishment has been confirmed at a couple of sites. But again, it has been released in other regions and, and establishment to date at those sites is unconfirmed or failed. But establishment has, is, uh, they've established pretty well in Waikato and Auckland in the Bay of Plenty. And these are just some examples. So again, similar to the woolly nightshade lace bug, uh, the, the, the lace bugs, the privet lace bug doesn't do very well in, in sunny sites. So you can see there's evidence of establishment there. They're definitely around, but not not really anything significant, and uh, but whereas damage to to plants in shaded sites can be quite severe, and uh, we do we have had anecdotal reports that the lace bug can be extremely damaging to privet, Chinese privet. So um, there there might be there might be things happening that we don't know yet about. But our colleagues again in in Auckland are are planning to start uh, um, do an impact trial or just monitor monitor the impact of of the lace bug um, because it's predicted that Chinese privet will benefit from any reductions in in trad because they co-occur in a lot of areas so areas areas where the trad beetles or, or the fungus have been really successful we expect um, Chinese privet to do really well or uh, benefit from from a reduction in the trad so they're planning to release uh, the Chinese privet at these sites and see um, what the impact is. Field horsetail uh, has quite a limited distribution in New Zealand. Uh, it's mainly an agricultural weed, uh, but where it occurs, it's really nasty. It's a nasty weed. Um, only one agent has been released so far, the field horsetail weevil in 2015. Both the larvae and the adults are very damaging to the plant. Um, the larvae or also completely hollow out the stems and can kill whole stems as they bore down into the root system where they continue to feed and then pupate. Um, so this this project had a few challenges uh, from the beginning. Uh, so originally, field horsetail was being 
grown in these potted plant in these plant pots that we we use to propagate most of our, our weeds for rearing agents. Um, but the weevils weren't do, doing too well, and because they they need um, quite a lot of stem material, the researchers and technical staff in the pro project decided to change again rearing strategy, and they started growing the field horsetail plants in massive bathtubs they were called but really big tanks almost so that they could so the plants could produce this really nice um, uh, thick root system and um, that dramatically increased uh, rearing success and they were then able to re release much higher numbers of the weevil um, in 2018 and just recently so obviously the releases were made with the uh, field hostel in dense uh, infestations are the worst and um, we just recently got uh, uh, good news um, and the, the field horsetail working group was was very pleased with the results because this project has been going on um, for quite some time. But uh, it looks like the weevils have established at three of the six release sites. And these are just some of the pictures that were taken at all of the at, all, at th the three release sites showing the damage by the weevils. So again, watch this space. We're hoping that their numbers will um, Will really grow now and start to do. They'll start to do um, some really measurable, have some me measurable impact in the field. Uh, Tatsun, another nasty widespread weed for New Zealand. Um, a widespread distribution. Uh, two agents have been released in New Zealand, also both in uh, uh, 2017. The Tatsun beetle, uh, both the larvae and the adults, damaged the leaves of the plant. Um, for the first couple of years, there was very little after its release at uh, quite a few sites. It's, uh, there was very little evidence of, of establishment, but in the last year or two, I think, uh, we've really started getting uh, good reports of, um, of, of visible damage in the field. I observed some myself um, up in, in Hamilton in the Waikato, and uh, some really exciting news that we got also this last summer. A, a little population of the beetle was released up in Northland just after lockdown when we were able to send agents out again and uh, the regional council checked regional council biosecurity offer checked the site later that summer and found some adults and evidence of feeding damage so it looks like this agent is potentially starting to to take off and uh, could be very damaging to um, to Tatsun. Then the Tatsun moth um, is a very damaging agent um, in the lab to or to the plant. Uh, the larvae, um, the larvae feed on the short tips and uh, the insides of the stems, reducing plant growth, and they also feed on inside the fruits, completely destroying the seeds. And really high numbers of this agent uh, were, have been released uh, throughout, um, well, almost throughout the distribution range of, of Tatsun in New Zealand. And unfortunately, to date, no confirmed establishments at any of the sites, but it potentially could be early days. Then giant reed, uh, also a nasty weed, although it's got quite a limited distribution, but it was one of, um, it was in the, one of the, one of the top 100 worst invasive species listed. Um, so this agent is the giant reed uh, gall wasp, um, sorry, giant reed gall wasp, that was released in 2017. So it attacks the stems of the plant, the larvae feed inside um, the stems of the plant, calling the causing these swellings and protrusions which stun plant growth. And then the adults um, exit the stems, leaving very distinctive um, exit holes, or emergence holes. Uh, this agent has been released at a couple of sites around New Zealand and um, no evidence of establishment to date, but it is still early days. Uh, a couple of reasons potentially, if numbers are really low, it would be very difficult to pick out these, you know, tiny little pinhead sizes on um, in a major dense infestation. And we're also looking at the potential for differences in plant genotype between the native range of the wasp and New Zealand, but that research is ongoing. Then whorehound um, is a, a major pasture weed, uh, mainly on the South Island. 
And uh, this was an extremely successful biocontrol program in Australia. So it's what we would call a piggyback program or a repeat program. Uh, so we didn't do any of the, the pre-release research on these agents, but they were uh, introduced into New Zealand on the basis of host spec work that had been done in Australia and the success of these two moths. So the plume moth, they, they, uh, the damage of these two moths is also expected to be complementary. Uh, the plume moth attacks the above ground plant parts and the clearing moth attacks the roots of the plants. So several releases um, took place from, from 2018 and establishment has now uh, officially been confirmed at uh, two, five, five, five of the 11 release sites and they've successfully made it through two winters. So that was really exciting news and this is just uh, this was the these top two photos of uh, we're taking at the first site visit which was done in the summer of 2020 and only a little bit of feeding damage was observed um, and little, little evidence of establishment but there was at least something there but this was disappointing to uh, the research team involved because the plume moth is the one that established really well and very readily in, in Australia and it looked like it wasn't doing going to do very well. Uh, but the second site visit this last summer in 2021 was uh, a lot more encouraging and you can see here quite severe defoliation um, being done by the plume moth too and the plants looking a bit stressed and, and damaged. And then this is uh, the clearwing moth. Uh, so again, so these the, these little toothpicks. This is how the clearwing moth was released. The, these little tiny black eggs were painstakingly glued onto the toothpicks, and then they were put out into the field. And each a hawhound plant received one toothpick with one moth egg. And um, the results from the first site visits um, in 2020 were more encouraging than the plume moth, which you can, you can see a couple of dead hawhound plants here and this is a very nice example where you can see this orange tag that was attached to the plant indicates that it had this plant had received a, a clearing moth egg and the one sitting next to it growing next to it didn't and um, you can see this plant has been killed by the larvae that obviously burrowed down and, and damaged damaged the root system of the plant and then this was the second site visit in in 2021 and um, at one of the sites and you can see um, the before photo lots of hawhound plants scattered around and this uh, photo from a couple of years later um, much uh, lower densities of the plant and it looks like someone definitely been killed off by the moth. Then this brings me to the last agent that was released in the decade that I was to, that um, I've been working on or talking about. Um, moth plants are another climber, nasty weed in the North Island. Uh, it uh, smothers and kills plants right up into the canopy. And this is the moth plant beetle that was released in 2019. Uh, the adults feed on the leaves, but this is mostly um, cosmetic damage. The, the real damage is done by the larvae, which feed on the stems of the plant and uh, it was so damaging in the lab that they um, we have to control we have to control the numbers and they can kill whole plants in the lab so it looked like it was going to be a very promising agent from the outset um, but it was released at three sites after we got approval to release and the exciting news uh, from this story is that there we've got a 100 100 percent establishment rate so far so they were released at three sites uh, in late 2019, early 2020, and our biosecurity um, officers, colleagues, um, returned to the site and at, at all of the, the release sites in Waikato and in Northland, they recovered adults and um, saw some feeding damage. So this is really another very um, exciting result very early on. Uh, so yeah, looks like it's, it could be a good one as well. We are also looking at other agents another agent for a uh, moth plant, which um, damages the, the pods. And then because it's a biosecurity bonanza, I've decided to add in two additional weeds just because we're really starting to, to get uh, very good reports on, on visible damage um, across the landscape um, from people, from biosecurity officers, uh, members of the public um, sending emails 
to find out where they can get their hands on on the agents. So I'm sure this is a very familiar site for many of you, especially in the South Island. Uh, so the broom gall mite was released in 2008 and um, has established quite well throughout the South Island, a little bit in the, the North Island. And um, the mites live in colonies and they feed on the on the spring buds of the plant and they cause these deformed these deformed growths of the plant, which um, which stun plant growth and reduce flowering and uh, galls tend to uh, they act as nutrient sinks. So heavily infested plants can be killed and um, under severe stress. So the mites uh, spread very quickly. Um, these these mites balloon on on wind currents, and so they they very good dispersers. They, however, haven't established in some parts um, of of the country where where broom is a problem. Um, but we've got so many photos like this of where I mean the, the you know broom plants are absolutely just covered in gold, and, um, and just more and more, especially this last season, I've got a couple of emails from people asking uh, where they could uh, where they could get broom gall mites or and how best to distribute redistribute them um, on their properties or to take them up to. Um, other parts of the country, and um, one of my favourite stories, the, the biosecurity officer, one of the biosecurity officers in Otago Regional Council, um, apparently said that this last season they used to regularly get calls uh, from members of the public about broom and all the yellow and something needed to be done. And this last season they hardly got any calls because there was no yellow. Um, so the plants are, are really being significantly damaged by the, the broom, broom gall mite in. Quite a few areas of the country now. I'm sure some of you from Christchurch have noticed the the, the Port Hills are looking a little less yellow. And these are this is just also just a nice example of of broom plants that have been killed off by the broom gall mite. So very exciting developments there. And then uh, the Calif Californian thistle um, and other thistles is has a, had a read by control agent released in 2008 called the green thistle beetle. Um, so the adults make some feeding holes, uh, but the damaging life stage is the, the larvae which uh, feed on the leaves and can de defoliate whole plants. The larvae are very distinctive, um, as you can see, and they have a, a funny little quirk where they collect malted skin and frass, which is basically poo on a spine on their back, and they use this as like a protective parasol to protect themselves from predators. Um, so uh, yeah, and this uh, this beetle has also been doing really well. It's established pretty well throughout the distribution range. Um, well, not 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 in the south so far, but um, and again, um, I received lots of lots of reports from 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 people wanting to find out where they could get some green thistle beetles, and this is the kind of damage that we've seen at some field sites. Also, um, this is the one that I've I've observed firsthand and it was really very impressive with the number of, of larvae and adults on the thistle plants that were looking very very severely stressed and um, you know, so just another another project that looks like an emerging success uh, and we'll continue to keep an eye out on that. So that brings me to the end of the whirlwind tour of the decade and um, none of it was my work so <laughs> I want to Definitely acknowledge all the people in, that were involved in this impressive amount of work that's been done. And uh, this is the, the, the research team, uh, biocontrol team at Manaki Fenua, and then of course the funders and their staff, all the biosecurity officers, volunteers, um, members of, of um, working groups um, that have all contributed to this, this research. Thanks. Excellent, Angela. Thank you very much for that. That was a very comprehensive run through <laughs> all of our biocontrol um, projects and agents, um, or certainly the the major successes that we've had in the last decade or so. So it's some some really good uh, good news stories in there. Um, Angela, we have some questions here. So. Um, Penelope Gillette has asked, would it be possible for a community group to obtain one of these biocontrol agents like the Barnbury Weevil to help with their local control efforts and to provide feedback observational data for this research? 
Oh, well, we welcome um, any support from, from working groups or member or community members. Uh, I, we're not currently rearing the Darwin's barberry seed weevil, so um, I, we would have to try and f look for signs of establishment and see if we could uh, recollect uh, from the field. But definitely, um, if there's an interest there uh, from community groups to get involved, um, absolutely. Yeah, historically, if if we have community groups that are interested in receiving our biocontrol agents and we've completed rearing them, um, we usually um, send you to the local biosecurity officers at the local regional council who um, we will have made releases to and you can go and see those people and talk to them and hopefully they might have an established site somewhere where you can collect from or recollect from and, and redistribute from onto your... Um, other areas, so so yep, quite right. Um, Becky Trigg has asked a question. It was great to have an update and see success with so many weeds that we are currently paying contractors to control. She then asks about what are the requirements around spreading biological control agents ourselves in the context of finding it in the wild and transferring it to other weed sites? Do we need to do it through our council biosecurity team? Um, what rep and what sort of reporting is required if they do? Um, Hugh, maybe you want to answer that, or, <laughs> or maybe some, or one of my colleagues, because I don't know that there it would be any issue with um, people collecting from sites and redistributing themselves, and uh, that would be my answer. And of course, if you can report back to us, then and that we could add information to our database even better. But I don't know if that's correct, or there there are protocols that I don't know about. Hugh? Yeah, no, um, it, there's no problems with um, collecting biocontrol agents and redistribute them around the countryside. You don't need any permissions to do that kind of thing. Um, if you find them commonly on weeds nearby where you are or in your local area, then pick them up and move them around. Feel free to do so. But if you can't find them commonly, or you're not sure where they are, or when they're where they might be available from, then do contact your local biosecurity officer from your local regional council. Those are the people that know where we've made releases of these things and where they're likely to occur. If they're not sure, they will ask us as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's generally how you'd go about it. But there are no restrictions to doing that kind of thing. But if you're unsure at all, then certainly talk to your regional council biosecurity officers. Um, David Price has asked, is there anything going on with old man's beard biocontrol? Yes, there is lots going on with old man's beard biocontrol. Um, yeah, I didn't didn't cover it because we we did release a, an agent in 2018, but it was a re-release of a sawfly um, that we think has established at a site in North Canterbury. A uh, release of the of the old man's beard gall mite is imminent. Uh, the first releases are due to take place um, this this coming, I uh, think, spring or late winter. And um, and there's then we've also got some survey work going on in the UK um, and Europe. Uh, some collaborators are look, currently looking for plant pathogens for us for old man's beard. So still definitely working working on that weed. I know it's a really bad one for New Zealand. All right, another question, uh, Kiko Hashiba. Yesterday's presenter said biocontrol agents never eradicate target weeds. Are all these biocontrol agents uh, are being used to keep weeds at bay um, for the target? Well, it can very much depend on what type of biocontrol agent it is. So if you've got a seed feeder or something that damages the, the fruits or then they're only going to reduce spread. Um, biocontrol agents that can that can kill whole plants can obviously significantly reduce the density of weed infestation. So it really but very but yes, it is true that um, biocontrol agents never eradicate their host plant. Um, Yep. Um, Greg Shirley um, has asked, are there any lessons learned? This is going to be, this is quite a question actually, I have to say. Are there any lessons <laughs> learned from the 10 years of experience which can be used for future biocontrol of weeds here in New Zealand 
or in the South Pacific, where land care has other weed biocontrol work going on. And many thanks to the presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, that's a, that is a good question, an interesting question. And most definitely, we're always learning from previous experience. Um, the science is advancing all the time, um, and and even just just simple uh, lessons from from how we release agents. What's the best approach? Uh, do we release large numbers um, or at, at, at fewer sites, or it's or um, small numbers at at a, a larger number of sites up to um, where we you know actually do um, our colleagues are doing work to try and advance the science to make it safer and cheaper and more effective. So we're learning all the time, and there definitely will be many lessons in there from the past uh, decade, but uh, from from when we buy construct control started in New Zealand and it's practiced all over the world so um, yeah it's a it's it's always an evolving science and uh, yeah we're always looking to improve ways to get better results cool uh, David oh no not David I have oh yes no David Price um, has asked a second question here <laughs> is there a comprehensive compendium of New Zealand biocontrol agents that we can use as reference um, in the August issue of our newsletter, our quarterly newsletter, we um, have a full list of all the agents that have been uh, released in New Zealand. Um, but Hugh, do you know of anything else where we have it's available um, to for people to access? We've obviously also got our website, which has a lot of information there on the weeds programs and the agents and. Um, yeah, I mean, we do have a lot of information that we've provided out there over the years. We did at one stage produce a booklet, booklet that was fairly comprehensive, which gave a bit of information about each of the biocontrol the agents and where they've been released. But unfortunately, these things get out of date very quickly. And so we've tended to move away from providing that kind of comprehensive compendium of information. Our website's probably the best place to go to, um, or the newsletters, which you yourself, Angela, are now you know um, producing um, with information about about all of them. <clears throat> but everything that we do um, gets out of date so quickly that um, because these insects get moved around and some die out, some establish, some um, have rapid impacts, that our information, if we do was to publish these kind of things or put it out a booklet type thing, gets out of date very quickly. So we've tended not to do that. Um, but yes, a good point there is the Biocontrol of Weeds book, which has extensive information about all the agents, yep. where to find them, how to redistribute um, any inform useful information there is in there on each agent. Yep. Um, Verity Forbes, my colleague Verity Forbes from DOC has kind of just given me a bit of a heads up about the fact that um, the previous one of the previous questions about transferring um, biocontrol agents around other parts of New Zealand and redistributing them. Um, Verity works for DOC and she's just suggesting that you may need to gain permission from the Department of Conf Conservation um, if you were to move agents onto conservation land. Uh, um, yeah. So okay, it's sorry. worth just keeping those kind of things in mind. Um, so thank you for that, Verity. Um, CG Abe has asked, is the fungal biocontrol, um, has the fungal biocontrol been applied on farm as well? What sort of research has been done for fungal herbicides? So that's Michael herb, myco herbicides. Mm-hmm. I don't actually know much about how much work has been done on microherbicides in New Zealand. Who do you? Um, we've looked at it um, uh, on some um, potential um, herbicides to be developed as microherbicides, but the process is exceedingly expensive yeah. and um, doesn't for New Zealand hasn't worry hasn't warranted the investment. Um, but equally the uh, level of control is often tends to be inconsistent um, with a number of microherbicides that have been produced um, historically. So not something that we have delved into in any great amount um, and are unlikely to in the near future that I'm aware of. <clears throat> um, right, next one uh, from Shane Homer. We've, we've got a few here. We're gonna have to stop soon. So um, I shall ask about three more okay. and that's about it. 
Oh, um, so Lindley Hayes, our um, overriding supervisor with all of our work, has just uh, has given me a note that there is some work currently to explore mycoherbicides for the nacella tussock control. So, um, so that's one thing we are working on. Um, Shane Hona here has said that he's heard that alligator weed flea beetle is going great guns in the Waikato. Would this agent work in the Bay of Plenty? I don't know, Shane. <laughs> the, the, the short answer is it, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, let's try would be my answer. It's obviously a good chance if it's doing really well. When did you, oh, yeah, sorry, it's not a two-way conversation. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll have to talk about it again, Shane. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, anything's worth a try. <laughs> Yeah, so I think it depends on whether um, the alligator weed is regularly flooded or frosted or the terrestrial form. So um, if it's the same type of alligator weed that the flea beetle um, works well on um, up north, oh, yeah. if that's present in the Waikato, then um, sorry, in the Bay of Plenty, then it will do the same job. So. Um, Rod Hitchmo has said, what do you think the primary predators of the white admiral butterfly are? birds, invertebrates, or wasps? Uh, sorry, I didn't actually mention that. They have a wide, that was, um, uh, they did take that into account when they, they did that study. Definitely vespular wasps, um, and then, but a, a, a range of generalist predators like praying mantids, uh, uh, ladybugs, ants. Um, yeah, so they, they're a pretty easy target for whatever's out there. Um, Anka Hansi has asked, many of the control agents are beetles. Will these be able to spread themselves from one area to another, or do they depend on humans moving them around? Again, that depends on the agents. Uh, some beetles can be very good dispersers, um, and others need some, some help or are not particularly good. But I think generally beetles are, can be pretty good at dispersing themselves. Yeah, generally beetles, most beetles are pretty yeah. good flyers, including weevils, so they are generally really good at spreading themselves around. But we do always encourage people to collect things and spread them around once they're well established themselves. It always um, aids in getting agents spread to all the corners of the country. Um, last question, Bill Trompeter has asked, great to see so many biocontrol efforts and successes. Is anything going on for climbing asparagus? Climbing asparagus does have a an agent. Um, it's got a pathogen, doesn't it? Yep. Climbing asparagus, yeah. yeah, it's got a pathogen. I don't know how successful it is. I don't know much about that program. But I I've think it was... Ex sorry. Oh, sorry, Hugh. No, that's right. Okay. I was going to say I've 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 seen the um the pathogen um at work in Australia and it is very impressive. Um, so it was uh, discovered. Ooh, hang on, am I might have the wrong species. So my Smilax has a ah yeah bridal bridal creeper is controlled well by the rust rust but not climbing asparagus. I must admit I've got those oh, two okay. confused before myself. Um, so at the moment, no, we don't. Um, we aren't working okay. on climbing asparagus. Sorry. I'm getting lots of answers sent to me by my colleagues, which is really cool, <laughs> including Holly mm -hmm. from, Cox from um, uh, Auckland Council. So um, they're, they're keeping me well informed as to what the latest information is. All right, um, so thank you very much, Angela, and to all of those that have attended. Um, really cool to have your um, attendance um, at our webinars this year. Um, it's been um, a pleasure to bring to you all um, the science and the work that, that we are doing um, and that we've been doing in the last couple of years and to bring these webinars to you as well. It seems to be a great um, platform to actually uh, to bring our science to you and as, too many, as, as many people as possible. So um, thanks Angela and thank you all very much. We'll catch you all again later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.